and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top-selling games from August 1988. I check out the Omni 128 HQ. I play some games, have a chat with Jeff, and end with some oddware. But first, it's the news. A new game from Destiny Software called Diamond will come bundled with an audio cassette from a new band called The Company She Keeps. It is hoped that future releases will also include audio tapes to allow different bands to get their material to the public. Any band who wants to take up this offer can contact Destiny. Codemasters are in a spot of bother over their new release, Race Against Time. The game, which is part of the Sport 88 initiative, will see sales go towards this cause, but they have been forced to remove the cover image of the athlete Jesse Owens. Codemasters, instead, will be using Cal Lewis on future covers. The exact reason for this is as yet unknown. The follow-up to the popular beat-em-up Barbarian is the cunningly named Barbarian 2 from Palace Software. Although, before even being released, the game has hit the headlines due to its cover that features Maria Whittaker, a page 3 girl in a skimpy bikini. This is not the first game to have problems with cover art. Vixen from Martek also ran into issues with an image of page 3 girl Corinne Russell, also in a skimpy outfit. The lesson here then is, if you want some free publicity for your game, get a page 3 girl to pose on the cover in a skimpy outfit. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. At number 5 is the compilation 10 Great Games 2. At number 4, Match Day 2 from Ocean. At number 3 is the compilation We Are The Champions from Ocean Software. At number 2, Outrun from US Gold. And at number 1 is Target Renegade from Imagine Software. And that was the news and top selling games from August 1988. This is the new Omni 128HQ laptop from Retro Radionics and sent to the show for review by ZX Renew. This is the laptop version, but there's the normal Spectrum version that comes without the attached screen. Inside can be found the Harlequin Super FO board, sporting some impressive specifications including HDMI, RGB, twin joystick ports and built-in DivMMC with dual SD slots. Taking a look around this impressively built unit, the case is a replica of the original 48k rubber keyed version, even down to the keys that feel just like the real thing. The difference though can be seen around the back and side of the unit. On the right hand side there are SD slots, along with an NMI button to trigger the browser, a bank of dip switches for configuring the device, and twin joystick ports, one for Kempston, the other for cursor joysticks. On the back we have the power socket, with a nice on off button, an expansion port, a mic and ear sockets just like the real thing, an RGB composite socket, which the laptop screen is attached to, and the HDMI socket. The screen is held firmly in place by strong metal mounts that go all around the bottom of the unit and act as counterweights. The hinges then come up the back and support the 9 inch screen. Because the device can be configured many different ways, this also means there are many different ways it can be configured wrongly, and if you happen upon one of these settings, you'll just get a black screen or a broken file browser. The bank of dip switches allow you to set the device for various Spectrum models, including the 48K standard, the 128K toast rack and the Plus 2 SE. It can also be configured as a Jupiter Ace or ZX81, but more about that later. Other settings these switches are responsible for include the enabling and disabling of the Kempston mode, enabling and disabling the DivMMC, and switching between Uno DOS and the ESX DOS. With all these possible combinations, there is a chance you're going to get something wrong, and this isn't helped by the dip switches being labelled backwards, at least in my opinion. On the machine they're labelled S1 to 8, however, the settings in the diagram and the instructions are the opposite, so S8 is in fact S1, and S7 is S2, and so on. Once you get to grips with that idea, setting it up is much more easy. That's not to say it will always be plain sailing though. Let's switch it on and have a play. I have set the unit as a plus 2 SE, with DivMMC enabled, 
and ESX DOS. I prefer this setup as it seems to work with pretty much everything I throw at it, although some games needed the standard 128K toast rack option setting. The Harlequin is a proven board with exact timings, so all those fancy demos with border effects will work just fine. Once booted, you can use ESX DOS as normal to view and navigate the SD card. You can set tap files for output, you can set tap files for input, which means you can save directly to the card. If you just want to play games though, it's far faster to use the NMI button. This brings up the file browser. Sadly, it doesn't support long file names, but it's easy to use and the games load quickly by just pressing enter. UNODOS also does not support long file names, and the commands are slightly different. I suppose it's all down to personal preference which one you want to use, but at least there's an option to choose. The screen itself is nice and crisp with good viewing angles, and there's the option to change things like colour, brightness and contrast using the buttons on the side. You can also change the aspect ratio from 4.3, which is standard, to 16.9, this does stretch the game's screen though, and some people don't like this option. The sound output is a mixed bag. Some games were really quiet, for example Sun Bucket. Other games like Exelon were loud under some settings, but quiet under others. So it's just a matter of experimenting until you get the best balance. I thought this might be down to the use of the AY chip, but Exelon doesn't use it. 1 to 8 games though, like Outrun or Metal Man, will have loud music and effects, so there's no problem. The sound can also be output via the ear socket, as you would a normal Spectrum, so it's easy to connect it to something louder, if you want. Games that have issues with the Plus 2 and above machines, like Jetpack for example, can be made to work as they could with the real machines themselves. I covered this a while back. You basically have to have a preload command on the tap file, which switches it to native 48k mode. The unit is quite heavy because of the metal framework and screen, coming in at 1065 grams. But remember this is the laptop version, and it has an internal battery. Yes, you can unplug the specky and turn it on which at first was a little odd, you don't expect it from a Spectrum, it's almost magic. The battery life gave over two hours of use, and that was constant playing of games, typing into adventures, watching demos, and using the file browser. Trying the ZX81 mode, and yes it's a ZX81, however when you boot it provides a menu, and here you can load from tape, or other things like RS-232. There's a copy menu, which lets you copy files from place to place. But despite me trying for quite a while, I never actually got a game to load. I tried several cassette recorders too, but again, I never had much success on a real ZX81. It would have been nice to be able to load games from the Div MMC, but I can't hold this against the unit at all. I mean, it's a Spectrum and that's what I wanted it for. The Jupiter Ace mode is pretty much the same as the ZX81, and with pretty much the same success rate. I really enjoyed playing with this unit. I wouldn't call it mobile gaming, but it's a novel approach nonetheless. I'll be looking to buy the desktop version once it's released, as the screen is not something I'll be interested in. I would rather connect it to my TV as I would a normal Spectrum. The only thing I didn't like was the faceplate, which was a little loose, and sometimes made the key stick down. But this is a review machine, so no doubt that will be addressed by a blob of glue when it's released. As with real Spectrums, on different configurations, some games will just not load on certain machines, and this is also true of the Omni. Setting your machine to a plus 2 SE will probably give you a good average, but games like Sergeant Helmet Zero and Pentacorn Quest still failed. Switching to a more compatible machine using the dip switches would of course fix this. It all depends on the games that you want to play, and if, like Jetpack, there are already fixes available for the later machines. A really interesting bit of kit then, well built and easy to use once you get the dip switches right, and a joy to play games on, and certainly a head turner.
using modern technology will ensure it keeps working too, and having a laptop specy sat next to me while writing game reviews was great. I could just switch it on, try a few things out, check out the accuracy of my reviews, all without having to wire it up to a television or power supply. Certainly worth looking at if this is something you're interested in. This is Surf Champ, released by New Concepts in 1985. The adverts for this game made several promises. The ultimate surfing simulation. The most realistic sports simulation ever. The most revolutionary concept yet in home computing. So what are the adverts banging on about? It was in fact the inclusion of a new type of games controller. Not a joystick or steering wheel, but a miniature surfboard. Inside the box you will find, if it hasn't been lost, a large plastic surfboard, on the bottom of which are various bumps, and a small plastic thing that I assume fits into the centre and acts like a pivot. The idea is, of course, that instead of using the keys, you control the player using this surfboard. Obviously it will only work on the rubber keyed versions of the Spectrum and sits on top of the keys. You place the little plastic square on the G key and the surfboard sits on top of this. This, however, raises a question. How would I use this in emulators to get video footage? The answer is the recreated ZX Spectrum. Yes, it's back. This is ideal for the job, so I quickly set it up to grab some footage. Before we get on to the game though, according to the instructions, there is an information program on the other side of the tape. Let's take a look. It's general details really about surfboards, waves and slang. Not really needed for the game. In the surfing picks section, there are some pictures, sort of, of people doing things on surfboards. But let's quickly move on to the game. Once the game is loaded, it asks you for some personal information, and apparently this will affect your skills based on the type of equipment you choose. You're asked things like your height, weight, sex, length of your surfboard, ooh, uh, and other various things. I had to look some of these things up on the internet, because the length of your surfboard versus your height and weight will give different performances. Anyway. Onwards. The five types of board you can choose are pop out for beginners, single fin thruster, the two fin, the two and a half fin, and the three fin thruster. Why does all this sound like a commercial for razors? You then get to choose some wetsuits based on the type of weather you're surfing in, pod, the summer suit, no suit at all, let's go nude, and the leash. Now we're getting kinky. The leash just ties you to your surfboard in case you lose it. Okay, I've chosen all that. Although there is a bug in the game that, when you choose your suit, nothing happens. Luckily, the previous owner of the game has written some instructions. Once you choose the number for your suit, you then have to press X and enter to carry on. Now you're ready to start. Let's get on there and see what all the fuss is about. First I chose to practice. And... Hmm, you're on a beach, you can walk left and right. So before you can even start, you have to paddle out into the middle of the sea, ready for a wave. Unfortunately, there are waves coming in all the time, and you have to avoid these. Once you get to space, you jump in, and you have to use the 1 and cap shift key to paddle left and right. Hmm, how exciting is this? Once you manage to get somewhere near the top, without being thrown off your board, you can turn round and get ready to ride. Once you're in the right position, you press the 2 key, and if you're successful, the game view will change. However, no matter how I tried, after hours and hours, I never really managed to get more than a couple of seconds in this screen. Sometimes it just flicked on and off and dumped me back in the middle of the sea again. Other times, when it did get onto this view, no matter what I did with the surfboard, nothing seemed to control the player. You're supposed to be able to move around and do tricks by pressing various parts of the board, However, nothing seemed to work, and it all seemed very laborious. The sound is non-existent. The graphics are poor. The concept was short-lived. And that about sums it up. You could send off for other beaches like Huntington, California or Banzai, Hawaii, but I don't think these ever were released. I've never seen them on any website, I've never seen them listed anywhere, so maybe they just packed in their bags and left. 
Overall, then a bit of a letdown. I was expecting great things and was looking forward to trying out this little plastic surfboard. But in the end, I was glad just to pack it all up and put it back on the shelf. This is Subterranean Striker, released by Insight Software in 1985. The cover, more or less, tells you everything you need to know about the game. It's a sort of scramble clone with a difference. Your mission is to rescue stranded humans deep underground in evil alien cave systems. There are multiple levels, and to progress, you just have to collect eight humans. However, it's much more harder than that. If you manage to collect all eight, a gate opens onto the next level. The first problem you come across is this lightning. It's random, so getting past it is a real pain. But there is a trick. You can turn around and go the other way. That's not immediately noticeable, but it does make things easier. Once past this, we get onto the game proper and into the caves. These caves are really tricky to navigate. Some of the passages are so small it's impossible to move through without hitting the walls. Luckily, when you hit the walls, you're not destroyed. Your energy is reduced, but you only have a certain amount, so you still have to be very careful. There are some sections in the game where you have to take damage to collect humans, which I think is a bit unfair. Around the levels there are bugs and worms and aliens to avoid. Sometimes you just have to time your movement and zip past them, but the aliens will need shooting. Progress is slow and calculated. However, if you hang around too long, an alien saucer will appear and head straight for you, and it's usually curtains at this point. I should know this game inside out, because I wrote a modern remake of it many years ago and mapped out all the caves. But it simply didn't help. The game is just too difficult. I wrote to the author all those years ago and he did say the difficulty was on the high side and he wanted to add inertia to the ship, but for me that would just make it even more harder. In fact, it would make it impossible. He also acknowledged that on the very last level of the Spectrum version, it's impossible to complete because a bug meant a bit of the landscape blocks the final exit. Anyway, back onto the game. The movement of your ship is stop-start, but that does help when trying to get through the caves and narrow spaces. Picking up humans is easy, you just bump into them. The movement is smooth and sound is well used, but it's just too difficult. Sometimes, because of alien placement and movement patterns, it's impossible to progress. The map at the bottom of the screen helps, it shows aliens and humans, but still, a very hard game. To see the other levels I had to revert to the RZX playback. And as each level arrives, the scenery changes. This one then is for expert players only. This is Horace and the Robots, a new game released in 2018 by Steve Snake, and this is probably the best Berserk clone on the spectrum. It was a little too late for my shootout a while back, but this would have certainly taken the prize. I can forgive the use of the Horace sprite simply because the game is so good. The movement is spot on, the sound effects are brilliant, and you can even get speech if you use the Karar speech unit. Controls are nice and the graphics match the arcade game, so they're not super detailed, but that's fine for this clone. But the difficulty is, I would say for me, slightly harder than the arcade machine. This is a great version, and the nearest you're going to get on the Specky. A great game then, definitely worth downloading. It's 
So a very um, contentious subject, I suppose, piracy. It is, isn't it? It's an interesting one. When you read things about it, I remember uh, Andrew Houston's book, if you read that, he has a go and he said even kids swapping games in the pay- playground was hurting sales, but there's an argument for that that I completely agree with, arguments against that that I completely agree with, which basically was true for me because I spent every single penny I was able to on software. Yeah. All my money, all my pocket money, everything I earned from my paper round or anything like that went on computer games. I, I'm the same. I, I At the height, I was uh, every Friday, I used to get paid every Friday. Mm. And I used to go straight to the software shop and I'd buy at least two or three games every week. That was about 15 quid a week. And if a friend came along and says, hey, have you tried this game? And I liked it, I would actually buy it because... I like to have boxes. I like to have the artwork. I like to have. I like to be able to see things on the shelf. Yeah. And I mean, I suppose the argument could be that if you bought it and you didn't like it, at least you still bought it. But I don't know. There were there were a lot of really bad games out there, and the people that wrote them really <sighs> can't say that piracy hurt them because the magazine slated them, and your and your friend got it and said, "Have a look at this. This is really rubbish." And you'd say, at least I didn't buy it. But I don't know. It's it's one of those things. Mm. I mean, the, the, I would say the vast majority of games that anybody showed me or lent me, or that I copied off anybody, and if I really liked them, I'd go out and buy them. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it was kind of try before you buy type thing. It was. I mean, also, they um, used to be able to have software libraries. There was a, an old, uh, not an old, there was a, a really dodgy video shop near me where I used to live, and they hired out Spectrum games for, um, I think it was about 50 pence a night. <laughs> so you, could, you, could, you could go, you could yeah. hire out a game. You know what's going to happen there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, But I actually used that thing because that was a try and buy. I mean, I don't suppose the software people got uh, got uh, anything out of it, and I presume it was highly illegal, but it's probably... funny enough, yeah, go on. funny enough, I've just been playing an old game called Subterranean Striker, mm. and the tape that I've got from eBay has got a soft shop sticker on it, so it has come from one of those libraries. All right. somewhere, in, yeah. somewhere in Milton Keynes, something called Soft Lie, as in S O F T hyphen L Y. I recently went into the attic and sorted through all the games I have, and I have hundreds, literally hmm. hundreds of original cassettes. Now, some are bought through eBay purchases, but most are from back in the day that I had. So now it's a lot like you. There were certain games in particular, the ultimate games, of course, spring to mind that. Yeah, I, I bought... In fact, I had a load of Ultimate games, and I still bought the Ultimate Collection. You know, the big box thing that goes for a fortune yeah. on oh, eBay? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I still bought that to get the map in the tip sheet and things like that that came with it. Mm, so, yeah. Well, um, I, I used to buy them because um, the early companies like Silversoft and Ocean... No, Silversoft is a classic example. They actually put numbers on their cassettes. Mm. And if you bought one, two, three, and five, you want to buy four, just so you'd have a full set. And even if somebody offered, offered it to you and say I'll, I'll tape it for you then it's not a full set on your shelf is it it's you know it's it's four proper ones and then a dodgy c90 and and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and the c90s if you had about 10 games on them that, that was more of a pain to try and find out where the game was yeah they were i mean there was all when all kinds of copy protection came in and stuff like that then your ability to copy a copy of a copy hardly ever worked actually so it, it wasn't like you could copy copies of copies of copies no, no. I, d- I do remember it was, this was late in the Spectrum's life and there was one kid at school apparently who knew he was getting a Spectrum for Christmas and between that, that term before Christmas so between September and Christmas had copied like several hundred games onto C90s wow. and it was like well hasn't he bought any was, no and it's like well yeah I'm not sure that's right <laughs> um, <laughs> no I mean I'm all, I'm all for support in the industry and, in, and even like I said back then I was buying three games sometimes three games a week mm. so I was all for supporting it but the thing that really annoyed me was when they actually started putting on these weird loaders because I had no end of trouble I don't know if I had a dodgy cassette deck or what but Daily Thompson's caused me a problem and Ghostbusters just uh, refused to load full stop yeah my Doomstark's Revenge I think I've told you before only lo- only loaded once or twice after I bought it mm. I do wonder if I had a pirated copy but it was such a kind of big box game that I'm not sure that it was. The box was a bit beaten up when I got it because I got it quite late. So I wondered if it had been and it returned back to the shop after someone had used it. And it... I suppose piracy did play a part, but mm. but because of that, I, th- I think that's why the, the, there was a, an increase in the 
demos. I don't mean demos as in Amiga demos, but the demonstration of the games. You know, the short versions, the one yeah. level versions, where you know you, you could play. I don't know the first level of R Type, and if you liked it, you could go out and buy it. And if you didn't like it, then it saved you a, saved you money and a, and a trip out. Because mm. they start they started putting out things like that on cover tapes, didn't they? They started putting out short versions and one level. They did. I've also got Doom's Dark's Revenge on on a cover tape and Lords of Midnight. Well. In fact, that was after I st- I'd stopped getting Crash. I think I got those two editions of Crash just to get those games. Yeah, I suppose it's one way of selling the magazines that were going downhill. Yeah. But that's, a, that's a different conversation, isn't it? Cover, cover tape <laughs> yeah, we've had that one. Yeah, we've we have, haven't one. we? This is Galaxians from Arctic Computing, released in 1983. This was a time when character-sized graphics stuttered across the screen in most arcade clones, but here Arctic have done a fabulous job in creating that arcade feeling. For me, this is one of the better Galaxian clones. The ship looks right, the aliens look right, the movement is right and smooth, and there's the swooping aliens. The screen size has been changed to be more like the arcade by adding a panel on the right hand side that shows scores and lives and the high score. This cuts down the play area, but it doesn't really matter for this game. The only thing missing for me is a star field and the shooting sound. I don't really know why they chose not to have the shooting sound, maybe just ran out of memory because the game code is really close to the 16k limit. Gameplay is excellent, really close to the arcade, and very enjoyable. I love this game. The game has nine levels of play, and you've been watching level one so far, so let's try level nine. The game speed remains the same, which was the usual method of increasing difficulty back in the day. The only difference I can see is the frequency of the diving aliens. There seems to be more of them at higher levels, making things hectic, especially with the limited firing. Overall then, this is a great game, a really good version of the classic shooter, and a joy to play. Definitely worth checking out. There were many ways to get speech on your spectrum. There was the Karar speech unit, as mentioned in the last review, and also in episode 11 of the show. There is an option to sample sound, using either software or hardware. We covered the Cheetah Sampler in episode 49, which gave really excellent results. And we also covered Quicksilver's Easy Speak, reviewed in episode 43. There was another option though, a sort of mix between the two. And this comes in the form of Soft Talk. Released in 1982 by CP Software, this provides a fixed set of words that you can use in your own programs. There were two volumes of words, Soft Talk 1 was what it called multi-word, and Soft Talk 2, which is the one I have here, and this is for space games. The list of words is impressive, and you can pick which one you want to use, or even use a simple program to build your own phrases. Alert enemies bearing 0.24 west. You have to load the entire word list into memory, so this means less space for your game. The inlay does mention the option to reduce the games list, but there's no specific details on how to do it. To use the words, you simply load in the main data dictionary into memory in your own basic game, and then by poking values, you can set the word to use. The words are sampled, and although you can hear them, this is an 8-bit micro, so don't expect great things. Having said that, it's not at all bad. Six, two, moon, yellow, stars, bearing, east, and one, star base, west. I'm not sure it was ever used in commercial games, and a voice very rarely adds anything to a game anyway. It was more of a novelty. 
A good idea though, but limited in use.